Hello everybody, this is the Physics MC. Today we're going to talk about three really important topics in waves. Hello. And they are these words. Reflection, which is basically the bouncing back of waves. Refraction, which is basically like the changing speed or changing direction of waves. Bending of waves, you can think of. And diffraction, which is basically how waves spread out. And there's also my shin. And uh, that's a different shin, but but reflection. Refraction and diffraction. All waves do it. What are they and how do we work with it? Let's get cracking. Reflection. Let's talk about reflection first. Reflection is basically when waves bounce back. And they always bounce back at whatever angle that they hit. So when a wave hits a new medium, for example, if I take a light wave, like a laser or something, and I shine it uh, it's off a mirror, it's going to bounce back at the same angle that I hit the mirror. And one way to think of it is that I can think about a light particle. Even though it's a wave, I can think about like a light, a light particle. Uh, or a water molecule does the same thing. If it's like a water wave or a sound wave, it could be like the sound channeling. So all waves do this. But think about reflection. If I take this ball, for example, and I drop it straight down, it bounces straight up. Because the angle that I hit it with was straight vertical, which is 90 degrees, and it bounced back at 90 degrees. So we have a really easy equation for reflection. Whatever angle you hit it with, the angle of incidence, we call it incidence, uh, is equal to the angle of reflection. Now, if I, if I draw a, a line right here at 90 degrees, and I, and I bounce the ball instead of up and down, I bounce it at an angle, it bounces back at that same angle on the other side of the line. So here's my line. Oop. So Bounce, boom, boom. So you notice, if I bounce it at a steeper angle, it bounces at a steeper angle. We always measure from this line. This vertical line, or 90 degree line, is called a normal line. We always measure our angles from that line. So our first equation for reflection is this. This is the symbol for angle. So the angle of incidence, basically the incoming angle, incoming angle, whatever angle I hit it, I originally hit with, is gonna equal my reflected angle, just on the other side of that line. So if it's 30 degrees on this side, it's gonna be 30 degrees on that side. If it's 40 degrees on this side, it's gonna be 40 degrees on that side. They're equal. So Let's see what this looks like in terms of like a laser. So here's what the situ situation is. Here's a laser, I can move the angle of this laser. This dotted line is called the normal line. And um, this is, uh, so that's the normal line right there. So it's perpendicular to both mediums. So air, and this down here is glass. I can change it to water or something. So I'm gonna change it to glass. And I'm gonna turn this laser on, boom. Look at this, the light ray actually goes down at 44 degrees, and then it bounces back at 44 degrees, and the angle measurement is measured from here to there for the incident ray or incoming ray, and the reflected ray is 41 degrees. If I change it uh, to maybe 33 degrees, then you can see that the reflected ray is 33 degrees from this line. Uh, it doesn't matter what color I change it to. Uh, it doesn't matter, um, like, if I use this, if I use a light ray, or I can use a water wave, and I do like a, a wave, um, or I do water or sound, it's the same thing. Uh, it always bounces back at the same angle, just on the opposite side of that normal line. Very good. So, if you notice this, there's actually two light rays produced from this laser. One's reflected, and the other one actually travels into the medium, um, and that's it's like it splits, like some of it's reflected, some of it's called refracted. It actually travels through, so it's bending the light. So it's not going in a straight line. Um, if I made this air, it would just go in a straight line. But if I change it to a different medium, it actually bends the light. So we're going to talk about what that is next. Refraction. Now let's talk about refraction, bending of waves. When waves enter a new material or new medium, they change speed. So there might be, like for example, light goes really, really fast in space, 
or in air, but once it hits something more dense like water or glass or diamond and it travels through that uh, transparent or translucent material, it, it slows down. It basically just collides with more particles and slows it down. So since a wave, it doesn't happen just with light, it happens with all waves. Uh, if a wave travels through a different medium, it will change speeds. And that causes it to also change directions. So let's think about how that works. Let's look at a picture here. Let's say that this top thing was a really easy medium to travel through, like air. So we have air. And the bottom material could be something more challenging to travel through, like water. And I take a, uh, a laser, like a red laser, and I shine light in from the, on the water at this angle. So this is my incident light, incident ray of light. Now, it's actually going to produce two rays. Since it's hitting a new medium, it's going to have a reflected ray. So what I'll do is I'll draw my 90 degree line. A lot of times it's a dot line for because uh, it's not actually there. It's just an uh, imaginary line that you draw. And whatever this angle is, the incident angle, it's going to reflect off that material. Boom! So you're going to get a light ray that pops up here. And this light ray actually splits into two. Part of it reflects, the other part refracts. So this is the incident angle, this is the reflected angle. But some of the light actually goes into the new material. And depending on how dense the material is, you get a different percentage of that light traveling through it. So here's what happens. When this light goes in, just a fraction of that light actually gets reflected. Most of it travels into the new material, like water. And it's going to make that light change directions because it's going to travel much slower in the water. So here's what you do. I like to think about the light as a car. So if I have this car that's driving down the road, zoom, and all of a sudden I hit this medium that's slower. This tire is hitting this medium right here. This tire is still moving really fast. So since this tire is like basically hitting a wall or a very, very slow substance, it's going to basically like stop or really slow down. So this is slowing down. This one's still moving fast. So that tire kind of stays still. And this tire bends. So the, basically it makes the whole wave or whole car change direction. So I'll model that again. It's showing this way. This tire hits. Boom. It's going to slow down. It's going to make it change direction and curve down. So the refracted ray will actually bend down like this. So it doesn't go on a straight path. Like if there was nothing there, it would just keep going in a straight line. But since there's a, uh, a new material, it actually changes the light wave. And like I said, it works for light, it works for sound, it works for what? Water, it's for any type of wave. Now, here's an example. You look at this. Here's a little funny face here. Um, it's in some water. Now when I change the angle, the light actually bends away and you can't see anymore. At a certain point right there disappears bye-bye it's still there it's just at some angle the light bends away from your eye and you can't see it anymore because it's not shoveling in a straight line anymore it's actually changing direction very cool so refraction bending of waves because it's shoveling into a different material or medium and actually changes direction so it has to change uh changes its speed, so it has to change direction to account for that. Here you can see how a lens or a prism can be used to bend light and actually get it to converge at a focal point. There is two equations for it, uh, for a refraction. The first one says, uh, hey, the index, so like how, so N is called the index, and it's basically saying, how hard is it to travel through this material? And it's just a quantity, it's just a number. How hard is it to travel through the material? So the incident index, how hard is it to travel through the incoming material, the material you start with, times the velocity of the wave in that material equals the refracted index, or index of refraction, we'll call it M lowercase r, times the velocity of the wave in that 
material VR. Pretty easy equation. So index sort of uh, uh, incident index is basically like how hard, how challenging is it for that wave to travel through the first material times the speed of the wave in that first material or velocity of the wave equals how hard is it to travel through that second material, the index or refraction, times the velocity of that wave. And so that's the first equation. It talks about just general speeds of the wave. But we can also talk about angles. How is the angle? Can you calculate what this angle is? Right here, this refracted angle. And the answer is yes. Here's the equation. It's going to be incident index of a uh, incident index times the sine of the incident angle. Times the sine of the incident angle equals index of refraction. How hard is it to travel through that material? Times the sine of the angle of refraction. This is called Snell's Law, and you'll probably hear about it over and over again, especially if we do any optics. So that's coming up. So, reflection. Incident angle equals reflected angle. Refraction. Index uh, incident times velocity incident equals refracted index times velocity of refraction. And you can also do angles with it as well. Incident uh, index times sine of the incident angle. Um, equals index of refraction times sine of the refracted angle. Very good. The last one is diffraction. Diffraction. Diffraction is basically the spreading out of waves. And let me explain. So basically, let's think about a, a wave. If I were to imagine this board was a water wave, and I did this, I'll put it like a point finger and then boom. That water wave is going to spread out. It's going to look something like this. It's going to propagate outwards. That's literally what diffraction is. But we can get a lot more specific than that. The spraying out of waves is what we're looking for. We can actually calculate some things with this. Now, let's imagine that instead of sending a pulse through, what if I actually just had like a bunch of waves like this? So these are like the tops of the waves, and they're traveling up. And all of a sudden, they get to this barrier and this with a little small opening in it. So maybe there's like a wall here, a little small opening right there. And so these waterways collide with the opening, and there's this little opening right there. And so these waves have to travel through the opening, and when they get to it, all this material has to squeeze in there. And then as soon as they get out of that opening, they spread out. So you start to get patterns that look like this. And they spread out, and they get further and further and further and further apart as you move farther away. So, basically, there's a, an equation to figure all that out, and I'll show you a little demonstration with that uh, in more detail here. So, let's get to that first. So, in order to understand diffraction, let's first talk about what does a wave look like. So here, I'm going to uh, just make some water waves. Here's a little faucet here, and this is kind of what I was talking about. So when I jump water here, uh, the tops of the waves, here I'll do a side view, so you can see what it looks like. These tops of the waves would be like illuminated as bright spots, and the valleys down here would be dark if they were in a shadow. I'll, I'll increase the amplitude so you can see what that looks like. I'm going to graph it. Um, it's just going to produce a sine or cosine wave uh, for, this, for this motion. But here's the, uh, let me actually just graph that just to show you. So you can see how the top of this lines up at the top of that. Now I'm going to go to the top view, just to kind of, so you can see how that matches up. So the top of this wave is literally where the top, top of this hill is. So the bright spots are the hills and the dark spots are the valleys. So if you were to look at the top of a water wave, this is what you'd see. If I increase the frequency, those waves get closer together. They're going to be more frequent. They're a lot smaller, um, and the frequency goes up. If I decrease the frequency, obviously the frequency goes down. Now, they get spread really far out. Now, this works for water waves. It also works for sound waves. Let's do a speaker. All right, here's a sound wave. Here, I'll play a tone here. Ooh. Increase the amplitude. If I decrease the frequency, it gets lower pitch. If I increase the frequency, higher pitch. Okay, very good. 
So this manifests water waves, saw waves produce the same pattern, and light waves also produce the same. Here's a laser, and if you were to look, like obviously a laser, you see the beam, you see the ray. But if you look at the actual particles of the of the the photons, here's what they will be doing. The same thing. They spread out as as they move far, uh, away from it, and that's what a light wave looks like as well. It's like you know, this is a lamp or something too. The light spreads out. Think about that inverse square law. How the intensity goes down. But waves spread out. That's the idea. So, let's talk about interference. If I have more than one wave, and like I said, when two or more, more waves meet up, they actually interfere, and they produce um, constructive interference and destructive interference. Let me increase the frequency so you can see all that factors in. So, I have two uh, faucets here, I think we're with, on water waves, and you can see that, hey, they are interfering with each other. Sometimes they cancel out. It's like this dull spot. There's no waves here. Here, the waves amplify. It's so like here the waves amplify, here it's dull. Here the waves amplify, here it's dull. Here it amplifies, here it's dull. That's interfering. So we're going to use the idea of interference, constructive destructive interference, and the fact that the waves spread out to actually produce some really cool patterns. So let's talk about barriers. So let's say I had a single barrier. I'll do a single barrier first. Let's say I had a, a pulse of waves here. It's going to spread out once it gets to that barrier because once all of this material, all this, like think about water for example, all of the particles of water have to pa pass through this barrier and then as soon as it gets through they want to spread out as much as possible. And you can see it's really really bright in the middle um, and the waves kind of diminish as they move farther out. But they do want to spread out once they get through the barrier. Um, I can even like Decrease the barrier, and they spread out even more. Increase the barrier, and they spread out. They still spread out, but just less. Now, if I had multiple openings for them to go through, now you can get interference because the way spread out here, the way spread out here, and you get interference patterns. So, if I um, see how many interference patterns we can get, uh, let's go a high frequency. High frequency would be a high color like this. Boom. And let's see what happens high amplitude. So you can see, look at this. All the spots where it's really bright, that's constructive interference. Where it's dull, that's destructive interference. Uh, maybe it might be better with water. So high frequency. This is really, really like dull water or flat water. These would be really, really big waves. Uh, let's get the uh, slits, uh, openings really, really small. So you can play around with like the, the size of the opening and how close the openings are together and the frequency of the waves and that produces different patterns or, or similar patterns but it's just how close the uh, constructive and destructive interference are to one another. So it's pretty neat because you can affect the results of that wave based on those interference patterns. So what you're noticing is that it's producing these weird patterns. It doesn't matter if you use sound, light, uh, whatever it is, all these waves are producing this destructive and constructive interference pattern because the waves are spreading out. So, what we're going to do is we're going to figure out, calculate where is it going to be constructive interference, where is it going to be um, destructive interference, how far apart is it, how can we use this to figure out some wave properties. And it's actually really, really cool. Well, finally, here's the uh, diffraction thing. You can see as if I have a hole here, it's going to go through the hole and it's going to spread out the waves. This can produce constructive constructive and destructive interference. If, if I have multiple holes, I reduce some really cool patterns here. Well, that's kind of a neat one. So, we're going to talk about what, where those patterns come from, why they are what they are, and how to calculate some of those patterns, and what, what's the point of it? Uh, what, what's the applications of it as well? So, if you look at that simulation over there with the water, if you notice the waves are kind of going um, and spreading out from the top opening, and the waves are spreading out from the bottom opening. And then they produce these interference patterns where it's constructive where the waves get bigger and destructive where the waves just kind of vanish. And so what I kind of did is we can actually do this uh, pattern uh, to produce some different equations to uh, figure out diffraction. So here I have, let's say I had some water, for example, coming through. It could be water, light, sound, whatever type of way you want to think about it. It's jumping through and it meets an opening here and an opening here. What are we going to call those opening distances, a uh, distance between them? lowercase d. d is the distance between the openings, how far they are. So you can adjust that. Obviously, another measurement that we can know 
is the wavelength of light, lambda. So I can measure that, or I can maybe calculate, we can maybe use this equation to calculate the wavelength of light, or sound, or waves, whatever it is, or the water. Uh, so we have one measurement, we have two measurements here that we can make or calculate. Another measurement that we can easily make, because like I said, once the waves go to these openings, they're going to spread out. That's what diffraction, diffraction is, is spreading out of waves. So the waves are going to spread out and produce uh, this, the arrows here just tell, telling the direction that the waves are going to go. So they're going to spread out as much as possible. And over here is like my detector. It could be like for a laser. A detector would just be a screen or a whiteboard or something you could shine a laser on. Uh, X-rays. It would be the actual X-ray uh, image that you would produce. Um, if it were uh, like water, this would be like the shoreline, and the water would produce uh, like that. So what, whatever type of wave it is, this is just a detector to actually measure what the waves are doing at that point. So here's my detector, and here's where the waves are being produced. And I hit this detector, so let's just use a laser for example. This is my screen, and it's going to produce these different patterns on the screen, like we saw in the simulation. And wherever, because this top one produces waves that spread out, this bottom one produces waves that spread out, and wherever they meet, that's going to be constructive interference. And so I just drew arrows to tell you which direction they're going. Wherever the arrows meet up, it's going to be constructive interference. So this is going to be like a bright spot. This is going to be like a big bright spot uh, right there. There's going to be another big bright spot on the screen right there. There's going to be another one right here. Another one right here. And I can continue this pattern, and there's going to be bright spots all in line. I didn't, I didn't draw the red arrows up here, and I didn't draw the black arrows. But I can continue that pattern forever, so it just keeps spreading out. So it's going to produce these bright spots where they meet up. And I can actually detect that. I can use that. There's a lot of cool equipment, uh, x-rays, uh, scanning electron microscopes. So a lot of technology comes from diffraction. Diffraction is probably the most important wave topic we'll talk, talk about all year. We'll talk about some applications of it. But anyway, so I can measure the distance between these bright spots. And they're always the same because waves uh, produce a pattern where the bright spots are always equally spaced apart, and the, uh, the dark spots are always equally spaced apart. So I can measure that distance. All right, we already used D, so let's use S. S is the distance between bright spots. And the final distance that I can produce uh, or measure is how far away this screen is. So this distance is capital D. So we're actually going to write down two equations here. Uh, how, how are these four uh, distance values related. How are how's the wavelength of light in meters, the distance between the opening in meters, the distance away from the detector in meters, and the distance away from maximum in meters, how are they related? Well, the first equation, I'll just give it to you. The other one, I'll kind of show you where it comes from. First equation is S equals wavelength times capital D divided by lowercase d. There's the first equation. And so basically, if, if I know, like, I can measure the distance between these two spots and the distance away from the screen. I can, uh, like, figure out where are these other ones. Like, if I know the wavelength of the light, I can figure out how far the openings are. And that's useful for, like, detecting what different materials are. Uh, X-rays use this as well uh, to figure out how to image things, um, how, how to figure out the space between different things and how to get really precise images. This other one, is about diffraction angle. So this is just all related to distances. Diffraction angle, I'll actually show you where that comes from. I can actually draw somewhat of a, a triangle here. So I can draw a line here, boom. And then I can draw a line, um, I kind of drew this not proportionate at all. Uh, I can draw a line from an S, and then I can draw a line to the D here. And if D was really small, and S was really big, it would produce a triangle, or really close to a triangle. So this is my S, this is my D, and my lowercase d here. It's going to get really close to a triangle. The closer I can get, the smaller I can get this D, and the bigger I can get this S, it's going to be closer to, closer to, a, to a triangle. So if I wanted to get a triangle measurement here, this is the opposite side, so we're going to measure this angle here. This is the opposite side. This is the adjacent side. Opposite of our adjacent is tangent. So tangent of that angle is approximately equal to S over D. So you can get the diffraction angle, how far the waves are going to actually spread out over a distance, 
with this approximation. Now the approximation gets better and better the, um, the smaller this opening is, uh, the better that approximation is. It's not perfect, but it's pretty, pretty close for all the applications we're going to use it for. We can just assume that they're, they're really, really close. Very good. So now we learned about reflection, refraction, and diffraction. I'm going to show you one more cool little demo here, and then we'll be off. So here we have a Bunsen burner just burning, and to the right of the screen is a diffraction grating, basically a little film with a bunch of small holes in it. So now the light from the Bunsen burner is getting to the camera, but right now, when I put the diffraction grating in front of the camera, we're going to see something kind of neat. Look at what the flame looks like now. First of all, it's producing some rainbow patterns, and if I turn the diffraction gradient sideways, you can see a little bit better, we get these dots. Those are the constructive and destructive interference. We also see these rainbows on the, on the left and right side of it. That's because fire is made up of all colors. Uh, it's the peak wavelength right now is about orange, but it's made up of all colors. So it produces a rainbow, and those two rainbows are constructive interference. Now, when you looked at it, if you were just looking at the flame by itself, it looks like this. It's just literally just a, a mixture of colors. So mostly yellowish, orange, and a little bit of blue on the bottom where the flame was a little hotter. And it's what the flame looked just regular, normal. And I turned the lights off so you can see it better, but that's what it looked like. But then, when you took this diffraction grating, now diffraction grating is basically just, like I said, a, a film. Um, and it has a bunch of really, 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 really small, naked, to the naked eye, uh, lines, like openings for light to pass through. And I drew those as vertical lines here with this, with this picture here. And the distance between those two openings, if you remember, is lowercase d. The distance between like this opening and this opening is lowercase d. When I put this up to the fire, first of all, since the fire is made up of a bunch of different colors, it split those colors up because every wavelength is going to have a different diffraction value. Because if the wave, wavelength changes, if you remember that equation, then S changes. That's why the colors from this um, fire broke up into the, the red, orange, yellow, made rainbows. So instead of seeing flames, we saw rainbows on the side. Then, basically what's happening is that every, it here was black because there was destructive interference, but then, like waves are traveling through these openings, and when they meet up at a certain point, they produce constructive interference. I'm over here, and then if you were to extend, there'd be some over here, and over there, but some over here, and the distance between those two spots, like the distance from here to here is S. This is from here to here is S. This is from here to the next one, which we couldn't see is S. So we have that distance S, and then that, that's affected by how far away the flame is going to be, so that's going to be larger case D. So cool thing is, we split light up into different colors. Even though it was white light, every wavelength of the light was able to spread out based off of the diffraction, because every wavelength of light has a different angle of diffraction. And that's where rainbows can come from, because when the rainbow light, basically sunlight, which is made up of all colors, hits water molecules in the air, the water molecules refract and diffract the light, and it spreads out, and it spreads it out over a large area that's also kind of like, why is our sky blue? Why are sunsets reddish orange? Why is like stormy days? Why are they greenish? It's all explained because of reflection, refraction, and most importantly, diffraction. Bending and spreading out of waves. Hmm, very cool stuff. So I'll wave to you guys for next time, and hopefully you guys have all the shun stuff down pat because it's pretty cool. I won't shun you on any more of that. Reflection, diffraction, refract. There's so many shun things. So anyway, bad joke. Anyway, have a great day. Wave later. Take care.